Hello everyone, Mike with Spray Jones and we're going to get into a fascinating subject today pertaining to the spray foam insulation market and that is uh, are we capable of making a home too tight? And we hear this one often and we've even seen some videos circulating around on the YouTube of people complaining about this and it definitely needs to be addressed so that's what we're going to get into today. Thank you to everybody that is subscribing and checking things out. Remember to check out the playlists for older material that you have missed. And uh, thank you for commenting and giving your feedback on each and every one of these videos and sharing it with somebody that is interested to know. All right, this subject, the airtight home. This is one where I find people really need the fat crayons from time to time. Uh, we can show people that the spray foam can control air and control water and control uh, the building envelope by being adhered. And then after we have shown them all of this data, we get the objection of, well, yeah, well, then the home can be too tight and uh, this is a real problem. And I just shake my head and laugh at this because there's supposed to be a tight wall and tight roof and an airtight home you want it okay you do not want to be at the mercy of the elements all of the time so let's just sort of start knocking down these objections and these myths like bowling pins we're going to break this into two parts the first here is going to be for new construction and then the second would be on retrofit so first of all you want your building to be airtight you want your home you want your commercial building you want the entire environment internally to be controlled by you and the HVAC system so some modern examples of that would be two things like a bunker or an underground facility is going to be more or less airtight and uh, a jet airliner now let's just take a jet airliner for a second you are up in the sky, it's freezing cold, you've got massive wind pressure on the outside of the hull of the plane, and you have got a pressurized cabin internally. How do you have a non-water, uh, high humidity environment? The answer is ventilation. You have an air purification system and a ventilation system, which is going to make sure that the, uh, the people have the right amount of oxygen level, and the right humidity level so that the cabin interior is safe and proper and warm and dry for the occupants. So if we can pressurize and control the air inside a metal tube, why can we not do and should do the same thing with the walls of your home? And that's exactly right. Natural ventilation, folks, with bad windows and leaky walls and leaky components within the building, natural ventilation is totally unreliable we don't want to be at the mercy of the wind and uh, the outside elements because of a couple of things one where's the air coming in how much of the air is coming in what kind of air is it bringing in do you want the air ventilating your house to be the air that's brought in along the floorboards I don't think so it is poorly distributed and it's going to be determined by driven wind speed Fresh air varies sporadically based on outside weather conditions. If you are living in heavily populated areas, a lot of times you can make the air inside your home much better than the outside air, the smog, the pollution, or whatever that you're going to be dealing with. So we don't want to sit down and try to make our homes ventilated by the outside elements where we have no control of it. We want to have a perfect envelope of roof and walls and then we want to put the mechanical ventilation to be designed and purpose-built to equalize, uh, ventilate and clean and dilute the air to the proper levels and that's what we're going to take a look at next. Remember your building is always wanting to achieve equilibrium so any air that is escaping out is needing to be replaced by air back in rather than saying we have no control over that we want to establish that we are in control of it we've sealed it airtight it can't cheat it can't get in we've sealed the windows the doors the walls the roof and now we want to force the air to be coming into the building 
through the access points that we give it. We want to filter that air, condition that air temperature-wise, humidity-wise, and then we want to distribute that air to the correct places. If we control the air and we control the humidity and we control the distribution, we can create the indoor environment that we want and we have a comfortable, safe environment. Does that make sense? I think that makes sense. All right, let's take a look at a report. So this is a neutral report by NRC, National Research Council of Canada, and they are supposed to be the neutral uh, governing body that develops code standards and issues reports and is the functioning body in creating our national building code. So they have issued this bulletin, and we're just going to read a tiny little bit of it because it is going to reference the American ASHRAE standards here later on. History of ventilation in houses. Houses need to have an indoor-outdoor exchange of air to replenish oxygen used by the occupants and remove pollutants generated by breathing, household activities, and emissions from building materials and furnishings. For many years, houses were constructed without mechanical ventilation systems and relied on air leakage through the building envelope to provide this indoor-outdoor air exchange during the winter months. In the past, this natural form of ventilation worked fairly well. Houses built before the 1960s tended to be quite leaky and pressure differences between the inside and outside caused by wind or temperature difference were sufficient to provide a significant amount of air exchange most of the time. However, a leaky building envelope does not always guarantee adequate air exchange. The movement of air requires both a pathway, example a leak, and a pressure difference uh, even a leaky house will experience periods when there is no indoor-outdoor exchange. Okay, let's scroll down. So you can tell right away that if somebody's advocating for an old leaky style method of uh, ventilating the house, they probably use a flip phone still. So the air exchange needs of houses are not uniform. That's where I'm reading. Not only do they vary from house to house according to the number of occupants and the presence and strength of various pollutants and sources, but for any given house they also vary with time as occupants come and go and pollutants and sources wax and wane. Nevertheless, ASHRAE, here's your American standard, 62 in the Canadian Standards Association and the National Building Code of Canada have established levels of air uh, change that can be expected to meet the peak or near peak needs of a majority of normal households. The latter two are based on some extent of ASHRAE standard 62. This is the part that I want you to see. All three approaches suggest an air change rate of about 0.3 air changes per hour. This level of air change used internationally as a norm in terms of analyzing the success of various ventilation schemes. Again, it is recognized that few, if any, houses require constant air change at a rate of 0.3 air change per hour. Now, moving on, they're going to say something shocking here. Uh, this is a 1998 report. I think that's going to be important to give some context here. They're saying currently available technology is not able to provide an ideal mechanical ventilation system for houses. <laughs> funny but before looking at the methods of mechanically ventilating houses that are available today it is helpful to identify the characteristics of an ideal system all right i agree with that one operate when needed two operate only when needed this is important since the mechanical ventilation system has costs associated with it the cost of the electricity to run it and the cost of heating the outdoor air and the system that it brings in the latter can be reduced by incorporating Heat recovery capabilities in the system that cannot be eliminated altogether. Therefore, the system should not operate during those periods when no indoor-outdoor air exchange is required. I'd call that ventilation on demand. The length, timing, and frequency of such periods vary from household to household. I agree. Air exchange is not required when there's no occupants in the house and there's no activities or processes underway that generate pollutants. Agreed. Back up to the top. And there is sufficient air exchange due to wind or stack effect to meet the house needs. Provide the needed amount of air exchange. The system would be able to deliver enough outdoor air to meet the probability maximum needed of the household. Agreed. Distribute outdoor air where needed. It is not enough the mechanical ventilation system change the air in the household 
To meet the standard of point three air change, the system must also be able to deliver the outdoor air to those parts of the house where the occupants are likely to be spending most of their time, living room, kitchen, and bathrooms. The system needs to be quiet and not interfere with other systems. Uh, the system would not create significant positive pressure in the house since this would drive hum humid air from the house through the building envelope resulting in condensation. The first two characteristics of an ideal mechanical ventilation system described above are related to the issue of control. A system that embodies these characteristics is known as a demand control ventilation system. Such a system would ideally be controlled by an array of sensors. Now I agree. So moving on to what they have here, a less than ideal demand control system would have at least one sensor. For example, many ventilator systems are controlled by dehumidistats. The system operates until the dehumidistat has determined that the humidity level in the house is at a safe level. Excess humidity is one of the main reasons that ventilation is required, but not the only one. Carbon dioxide, CO2 sensors are sometimes used to control ventilation systems in large buildings. Yes, yes, yes. They want to have a full array of sensors mentioned above. Uh, there is going to need to be in the modern day system now, they're going to have filtration, they're going to have CO2, carbon monoxide, and a VOC with some sort of activated charcoal system. So modern 2021 systems are now controlling the humidity, controlling the temperature, and controlling the purity level and then diluting the current air within the assembly of the home to meet the needs and the standards of what the house is looking for and what the occupants are looking for. Now, further to all of this, the system needs to be accurately sized by an engineering group. If you are going to have a drastically uh, tight envelope, you do not need to have a system that is oversized and running very little. The system needs to be sized correctly, or we would call it downsizing from what we've been known for 30 or 40 years. Correct size the system, balance the system so that it can now run and develop the right amount of air, the right amount of humidity level, right amount of temperature level, and right amount of runtime, and then have the proper ducting and distribution of CFM to the necessary rooms so that it can run, respond, and purify. I think most of the new systems that are coming out now are going to have multi-stage or very, even better variable speed. So not a two-stage or two-speed system, they're going to have a variable speed. On-demand is probably the best uh, in the last 20 years that if it needs to be done, then it's done. We're not just doing it every hour or every half hour or every three hours because that's what some program says. We're going to do it when the system calls for and requires it and it's going to be monitored. So you can see that you, in a new construction, you need to have a balance of two things. Airtight envelope, which is what the spray foam insulation takes care of, and then a balanced, coordinated, designed mechanical system. It is an insult to the engineering groups to think that we take no regard for their design in what we need to do. Yes, we need to design the system and then the system can be balanced and then if you need to have uh, accelerators and uh, boosters for flue gas or a water heater or something or a range hood, then those exhaust fan boosters and accelerators are placed into the system so that you don't have an updraft problem and that you are able to get the flue gases or the range hood uh, air out of the building and gone to where it needs to be. So now what do you do for retrofits? If you've got new construction, your new dentist office, your new commercial building, your new home that you're constructing, no problem. You get the mechanical engineer to come in, you design the system, you correct size it, you get the spray foam installer to come in, make sure the building envelope is well sealed like it's supposed to be, and the systems run in concert with each other. Well, what about retrofit? Um, I find that if you're doing a major renovation where you're gutting the whole entire house and you're going to be upgrading mechanical systems, then it's the same. Get the envelope established and make sure the systems are going to be correct sized. If you're yanking out the old uh, boiler system and the old air delivery system like in this old house or something like that, great. Bring in the modern systems, correct size them, design them, install them. The issue comes in when people are wanting to keep something that is maybe 15 year old or 20 year old technology.
They don't have a heat recovery ventilator. They have no way from bringing fresh air in. They've got a mid-efficient furnace in uh, that's burning natural gas or propane or something like that. And then you drastically tighten things up by putting spray foam to the walls into the roof. Yes, you can start to have uh, additional problems uh, inside the home where they're just not it's very very airtight and you've retrofitted it you've made it significantly tight but you haven't allowed for the other uh, ways of getting ventilation in. that's where you run into a problem so I want to make sure that if people are upgrading things that they take into a consideration that they're going to need to probably do a furnace now I've done basements and we've drastically tightened the home up. The guy did the windows the summer before, and then he got me to come in and spend three, four thousand bucks to uh, spray foam his basement, closed cell. And they've never had a problem upstairs, and now they're having problems upstairs. They got wa water on the windows. They've got a little bit of frost in the corners. Of course, these homes are batted, two by four walls, probably built in the 1950s, the 1960s. Don't have a vapor barrier, old paperback bats. What do you do? Well, you can't do a whole lot. Uh, you're not going to yank the spray foam out of the basement. The basement's the warmest, driest room in the home. You're going to eventually have to retrofit uh, the uh, the walls. Uh, if if you don't have an HRV at that point, I recommend that they do get uh, a heat recovery ventilator system in and then keep the humidity level and keep the fresh air down within tolerance where they don't get a problem with the envelope. But if the envelope is significantly weak upstairs, then they're going to have to take a look at retrofitting with yanking out drywall or updating uh, rigid insulation on the exterior. Very rare have I ever seen it where the spray foam in a part of the home has made it significantly worse and they can't seem to solve the problem. That's never the case. It's always one ripple in the pond is going to bring in other things that they now need to do down the road. And this is the price of ownership, folks. This is the price of owning capital property is that if you get better products put in you need to keep with the upgrade and and eventually do something else to accommodate it so I don't see a problem in retrofits uh, I just don't like it when there's old old equipment main, being maintained and then a significant portion I would say you'd have to do walls and roof and have a 20 year old HVAC system with no capability of ventilating the home uh, through uh, mechanical ventilation to really seriously start to notice having issues. Had one individual that did that. They, uh, they had an old mid-efficient and they were having moisture issues inside the house on the windows and they just said, well, it's time to get an HRV and we'll get the mechanical contractor back and start bringing some fresh air uh, from out to in. If and when I'm doing another house in my lifetime, uh, I will have the entire system designed with the most modern, up-to-date, variable speed, on-demand ventilation system and uh, distribute the air precisely, pinpoint precise where I need it to be, when I need it to be there, and everything will be within the touch of my fingertips and the ProLogic design of a monitoring system that'll even hook up probably to my phone and I can monitor it from a distance if I'm away on vacation or something like that. That's what I want. That's the direction that the industry is going. The technology is there to do it and I don't see why I wouldn't because it's not drastically more expensive now. Variable speed systems are not way more money than two speed systems and even if they were slightly a bit more I'm going to get that back on my return on investment and frankly I really don't care what the ROI is all the time it's what I want I want the system to be balanced and to operate properly and there's no reason why you can't have that on retrofit we've done a lot of retrofits where they have put in new ductwork new mechanical equipment upgraded everything and took grandma's house or the old 1940s or 50s home and upgraded it with closed cell foam or open cell and then upgraded the mechanical equipment so it just requires an investment that's why most spray foam systems are going in uh, on a retrofit on a renovation on something where you've gutted it and you've opened up the walls as opposed to just trying to pour this stuff in through a hole in some wall which I don't entirely agree with so that you can have an airtight home you can have and should have an airtight structure and then you should be placing the HVAC system uh, in control of what's going to happen and how it's going to happen. Now, if you do not 
have mechanical contractors that understand what has just been said in the length of this video, then search out the people that can. There's lots of engineering groups. Uh, Richard Rue and Energy Wise Structures down in Texas will, can do it. But from what I'm seeing, state to state, province to province, there are mechanical contractors both within Canada and the United States that can do this. This isn't a uh, albatross that you're trying to find, right? You just need to get through the old mindsets and the old ideas and the old tables and charts that they used to use of X amount of uh, CFM per person per, per square foot and get into modeling and actual design and actual uh, construction of the, the system. So I hope this has answered people's uh, questions and alleviated any fears and put to bed this myth that the home can't be airtight. It can be airtight. You just have to make other allowances for it. So thanks for clicking on the like and the subscribe and leaving a comment. And we will catch you on the next video. Bye.